we're rolling. Caroline, uh, pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to have you on. Um, and VE Day. Happy VE Day. I Happy noticed. Day. Thank you. I noticed just before we started this call, oh, well, about 15 minutes ago, I was doing a quick bit of reminding revise about your early early part of your career, which you spent in uh, in Germany. Yeah, which which was an amazing time to be there because my dad was based in West Berlin with the British military government in the early 1980s, mid 1980s. And I went there and had no real idea of what was happening there then. You know, I knew the Cold War was going on, but I had no idea what it was like to live on the front line of the Cold War and the fact that this was still, you know, under the four power agreement. You had the Russians over in East Berlin, you had the French, the Americans and the British, and that the city was divided up into sectors. And getting there for the first time, I think I got there age 14 or 15, it was just remarkable because you could feel it was like a city living on the edge of a volcano. You didn't know what was going to happen next. And you hoped that the Soviets wouldn't invade, but it gave a kind of weird urgency to life. And it was the most amazing city to be able to go up and see the Berlin Wall. And if you were a member of the British military government or a dependent, you could go over to the East, you could go and watch an opera, you could go to a museum, you could go and explore, but you knew that you were being followed and you knew that people couldn't talk to you freely. And it was like walking from a film in colour in West Berlin with all of the ads and all of the shops and all the life over into the east, which was pretty much in black and white. And it had that weird sort of yellowish smog from the lignite coal and from the exhaust fumes of the Trabant cars. And it was just so strange. And yet, even then, by 1985, it just didn't seem possible that the wall would ever come down. It just seemed this massive fact of life and that you had... British patrols and troops and Spandau prison, etc. And that seemed as if it would be eternal. And then I was back here in the UK, back at university in 1989 when the wall came down. And I saw it happening on television and I just wept because I couldn't believe that East Germany was going to be free, that these people that I'd met and tried to talk to, tried to get to know in the East, were going to have completely different lives. And that for me was kind of really key and wanting to go back and report on what was happening so yeah the BBC sent me there as a German business reporter in 1993 and those were probably six of the most interesting years of my life just reporting on how the two Germanys tried to come back together what life was like after the Soviets what happened to British troops for example and I remember the last parades there and even the last Russian parade where they sang a song and I was sitting next to an interpreter and I said well what, what was that song and he said oh well, you know, it's, it's a great Russian marching song and the final verse says, and we'll be back one day. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine it. You've, you've obviously, been a, obviously been a journalist for that, what, to over 25 years now, at least at least 25 years. 30, um, 30 so 25 with BBC, right? Uh, what? So you, you've, you've got experience of covering and reporting on defence related issues, um, military related issues from all the way back then, the Cold War, and right up to now. Has there been a much of a change in um, the public perception and reaction to military operations um, since pre pre 2000 pre information age pre smartphone social media to to now how has the way you communicate information changed to the public i think so much has changed that it's really hard to know where to begin because if you look back at a campaign like the falklands which you know i remember watching on tv listening on the radio listening to my colleague brian hanrahan who was an amazing reporter, reading the stuff that Max Hastings was sending out from that campaign. And in one sense, that was kind of the yeah. ideal campaign for the MOD in terms of you had absolute control of the journalists, that they couldn't send their material without using, you know, the communications kit on the ships or at Port Stanley or wherever. And you know, that great line about I counted them out and I counted them back in so that Brian didn't say how many aircraft there were. That was a classic because he couldn't say 
the number of aircraft, therefore had to find a great way around it. And I think as technology has evolved, the covering the campaigns has changed utterly and totally because the minute you got a mobile phone or a satellite phone, you as the journalist were able to take with you your own communications kit, you could bypass any kind of military control, or most military controls, unless you were embedded. So the use of embeds became much more prevalent because if I think back to someone like Kosovo in 1999, I wasn't based with British troops then, Kate Aidy and Matt Fry and several other colleagues were, but we were sent up to further to the west where the German forces were going to be coming in. And so we weren't embedded and we simply drove in. And at one stage I was trying to hitchhike in because some, um, well, various logistic screw ups had happened. And there, you know, you could go anywhere you wanted. We got a BBC house, we set up shop there, we got our own food, went to the press conferences that the Brits did, or the Germans did, or whoever did, but we weren't embedded. And the freedom that we had meant we could report on anything we wanted. And you know, try to balance it, try to talk to all sides within that conflict. But by the time I became defence correspondent and was reporting on Afghanistan and Iraq, it was very clear that you couldn't get access to, to the troops unless you did it via an embed, or it was very difficult to do. So some of my colleagues, um, like Alistair Leithead, who was based in Kabul for a lot of that time, he could go on embeds too, but he could go unembedded to places to report where you know, if you wanted to tell the story of Afghan civilians, that was pretty necessary. But I think for us, it's it's that constant pull and push between the military wish to see things reported as London would like it to be, or Whitehall would like it to be, and what you're hearing and seeing on the ground is a constant tension and always has been. Because if you look back to things like the Crimean War and um, the first journalist to go and report on the Crimea, they were kind of semi-embedded with forces all the way back then, but they were also trying to report on kit shortages or hospital shortages or medical shortages and all of that stuff. And at that time for the Crimea, I think it was the editor of the Times was called into Whitehall and, you know, told them, can't you control your correspondent in the field? You know, can't you stop him reporting all this bad stuff? And I think those tensions have always, always, always been there and that it's the job of the reporter to report as much of what you see, as much of what the truth may be as you can if you're out somewhere. But I think the, you know, the advent of mobile phones, I remember being embedded in the run up to the Iraq war and the invasion in 2003. And we were, as a BBC convoy, driving in from Kuwait behind British forces. And we were sort of pretty much at the back of the queue. And as we came into Kuwait, I had my mo as we came out of Kuwait, I had my mobile on, and my great aunt rang me as we were coming up to the border, and she rang me from her house, and she must have been in her eighties then. She said, "How are you, darling? You all right?" I said, well, "Yeah, I'm <laughs> fine, but now's not a good time, Mari. We're um we're in the middle of, you know, filming the invasion of Iraq." And she said, "Oh no, just you know, just wanted to make sure you're all right." And that was utterly, totally surreal. And I mean, by the time we got into Iraq itself, there were no mobile phone masks near where we were. So you couldn't just make a, a mobile phone call from that first operating base. But again, you know, there were tremendous battles between the correspondents and crews and producers who were there and the military minders who were there between the sort of the different versions of the story and what you could say and what you couldn't say. And in some sense, we had, you know, really privileged access to talk to people but it was also very tightly controlled. So, you know, there were people who were unilateral journalists, so who were not embedded, who were going around the edges of the conflict and getting some amazing stories. Equally, there were some who were killed because they got into the middle of a tank battle or whatever. And it was one of those big questions for the BBC in that particular occasion as to whether we use unilateral journalists as well. So people who weren't embedded. And in the end, what the BBC did, because it decided that it was really dangerous to be an unembedded journalist in that particular conflict was to place different teams at different locations with different units. So we went as a kind of forward operating base to the, um, what was it called? The Forward Press Information Center, which wasn't particularly forward. It did have press, but there wasn't a lot of information. So yeah, 
And I mean, going, going on to Helmand and Kabul in later years, I'd say the flow of information got even tighter. And it really was our job as journalists to try and figure out what was actually going on and what did people feel. And I think what really, really changed was the ability as well of soldiers, sailors, airmen, their personnel to tell their own stories. So be that via video or via websites or via social media, that is one of the biggest changes is that people in war zones, be they soldiers or civilians, can now tell their own stories. You know, I don't think it invalidates having journalists go there to try and report what's happening. But I do think it's been yeah, one of the biggest, biggest changes that in any conflict, someone can be, I don't know, a 15 year old civilian, but they can become the voice of that conflict if they're out on air and putting out their story. And I think also for, for the military, social media and the use of has become, yeah, well, information warfare and campaigns have become a really interesting and vital part of what warfare is about. Uh, and, and, a, and a nightmare in some respects. I mean, look at the uh, look at the the incident where the, the, the troops are shooting at targets of Corbyn in Kabul. I mean, that's, that's, um, was that last year? And other things. Yeah, I, said, I mean, we know it, it, it's a it's a double edged sword, you know. Um, but I, and then trying to strike the balance between, I suppose, for the military, trying to strike not for the military, but just for in general, trying to strike the balance between getting the information out, or as journalists, getting the information out to the public, or the value of journalism, I should say, mm. getting it out to the public. But it can sometimes be at the cost of public morale, if right's the right way to put it. I just don't know how to describe it. Where, where was, where's been, where sticks in your mind is one of the most challenging to try and report on? I'm talking conflict now. I think for me it was pretty definitely Helmand because it was so hard to get around you couldn't really I mean we did do some trips where we weren't embedded with the military when I was doing bureau covering Kabul but generally it was so dangerous if you were you know a civilian wandering around with a camera um and a microphone that also to to be embedded with the troops was the only really way as a defence correspondent to get some idea of what was actually happening in terms of the conflict there. But it was incredibly hard to build up a bigger picture. And you would get interviews with senior commanders or, you know, people back here in, in London would talk about the campaign. And if you went out there and then went into Helmand, it quite often seemed that the two messages were totally at odds with each other. That, you know, the upbeat, it's all going well message did not at all fit in with what you saw on the ground and this kind of mantra of progress is being made I just you know remember the summer of 2009 where people were dying at an enormous rate where it was incredibly dangerous and difficult for them to go on patrol and you know it, it was a really heightened awareness of the risks that you know the people were embedded with whether they were soldiers or Royal Marines that they were facing every single day in Helmand and it was so hard to get a handle on that and equally when you talked about the overall war aims you could see what people were trying to do but whether you know as we kept being told progress was being made well when you got on the ground and went to visit some of the fobs and spend you know a few, few days or a week or a couple of weeks there it was often really hard to see what that progress might consist of. I mean, you were out there. What did you think? Yeah, I think it's it's hard to see it because it's hard to see the progress. I think from a you know an outside perspective, because the most obvious standout thing when you go there or Iraq or anywhere else where there's kinetic activity going on, um, the the most obvious thing to see and take in and be impacted by is the loud bangs, the shooting, the attacks, the, the fear, the risk, the bombs, the IDs, and all of that. To see, I think, that, and that's really hard hitting and it's really fast paced. And I think my experience with with Afghan Iraq, I wasn't that conscious of it. I was, I was, um, I was lower ranks when I when I went to Iraq the first time. But certainly with Afghan, to, to see the progress, you have to be like constantly involved with 
the meetings with the local elders, it depends on, on what level you're operating on. The meetings with, with the elders, um, you have to be exposed to, constantly exposed to the intelligence you're getting about what the Taliban are doing in different areas, to how the villages are coping, the civilians, what supplies they've got, what they're getting out, what their commerce is like. Um, and as you say, that's almost impossible to see. You can maybe get a snapshot of it over a couple of weeks being drip fed by the commander, but you're never going to get the whole picture because as a as an organization you know this as an organization we we british military any military they don't like to give away secrets and we're always taught that well that's what we see them as secrets you know loose lips sink ships so we're always skeptical of giving information away and then you compound that with uh the skepticism around journalists often that people have especially in the military because of you know famous cases and it's historical stuff that people have made mistakes or being bad people in the military mean done for it, but it's always a journalist that breaks the story. <laughs> sure <your> fault. <laughs> always got to have someone to blame. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. When did you go to, when did you go to Afghan then? Started in 2001 when we were sent from Moscow, weirdly because um, it was just after the twin towers attack and because it was easy to get from Moscow, well, relatively easier to get on a plane from Moscow to, I think it was Tajikistan, ended up in Dushanbe, trying to get into the north of Afghanistan then, and ended up in what was the Northern Alliance's foreign ministry, which was basically a sort of mud compound where Abdullah Abdullah had his headquarters. And it was only a few weeks after the Lion of the Panjshir had been assassinated in that same compound. And that his room where he was assassinated was given to us, the women in our group to, to live in for then. And we spent a few weeks trying to set up house and find somewhere to live that had, you know, a supply of cleanish water, food, etc. But we kind of camped out at the foreign ministry um, for probably about 10, 15 days or so, something like that. And then everyone got very, very sick because there was a vomiting bug going around and there was only one latrine and when we first got there there were only about 20 of us and by the end of two weeks there was something like 120 journalists in that same compound camping in little tents and it was extremely insanitary so we in the end were very lucky moved out to a house that a french aid agency had rented but in fact didn't need so we rented that and started getting on our act together in terms of supplies and, and getting out and seeing, well, trying to talk to, to village elders and civilians. So this was you know, not a military embed. This was us, the BBC and all the rest of the world's media trying to get into Afghanistan while the Taliban still controlled most of it as a government. And um, this was a village in the north or small town called Hajabaudi that was really, really poor. And, you know, I'd reported from lots and lots of places that were poor, poor before, but I had never seen anything like this. I mean, it was poor enough that for all of the mud-built compounds, you know, nobody had the money for windows. There were barely doors. Um, there certainly wasn't electricity. It was really hard to get access to clean water. Food was pretty limited, you know, for the, the people who lived there. And it was just like when we flew in on a Northern Alliance helicopter, kind of going back five or 600 years, because it, it was just a place where life was still so unchanged that it was quite hard to believe. And I remember standing on a rooftop doing you know, endless TV lives and being asked by the shiny, besuited, made up presenter in London, you know, so what are people saying now? What's their reaction to, you know, what's happening in, in Afghanistan and Kabul, etc. at the moment? Because I think the bombing was happening around Kabul then. And the honest answer was they don't have a clue that it's happening. They probably won't hear about it for another week or two. They don't have radios because they don't have electricity. They don't have televisions. You know, maybe the richest man in the village does, but nobody else does. And there was that weird, weird disconnect between the massive information that was going around in London where, you know, everyone could talk to everyone and us over there kind of on, not necessarily a front line, but there was conflict 
going on there between the Taliban and the Northern Alliance forces. And yet the only information we could get was by leaving the compound in the morning and driving around to see what we could find, to just go to places and do, I suppose, you know, what we used to think of as really proper journalism when it wasn't online, when you couldn't necessarily phone people and get the info. You just had to go and see, you know, what you found on any given day. And you know, I remember very early on in that, that a bunch of journalists from other countries had got a lift from the North Alliance to go to a particular battlefield and they didn't come back. They were all killed by an IED and that really brought home to us, you know, the be careful where you go, know that you've got to be able to trust your driver, especially all of those things. And that, you know, the, the contrast between that and a military embed was also quite high because by the time forces were sent to Helmand, you know, we were going out in really heavily armoured vehicles by then. And when we embedded, you had the sort of the full military protection and fine going with military might make you a target as a journalist. But equally, it, it offered you a much better class of armoured vehicle than the kind of things that we were driving with the Northern Alliance back in 2001. And then going into to Kabul in 2002, it, well, late 2001, that Christmas New Year, as foreign troops and the... Um, was it K4, S4? I've forgotten the acronym. K4, I think. K4. No, that I, was Kosovo. Yeah, no, this was security. ISAF. ISAF. Okay. Anyway, whatever it was called. <laughs> Middle-aged brain here. It was really fascinating to see kind of the, the build-up in Kabul of what was happening and what was changing and that massive optimism that, you know, life will be changed and the Taliban were gone. And there was a huge, huge sense of celebration there. And... The new year was seen in. We had a BBC house there and all of our local staff came and danced and just celebrated and had the most amazing time because they were so ecstatic that, you know, they thought, at last we are free. This may be an end to war. And I am still so sad that it isn't and that those battles are still going on for, for how people should live in Afghanistan, especially for the women there. Because I remember going talking to, to different women, both in the north and down in Kabul in 2001 and two, And it struck me that there was so much potential there that wasn't used. You know, so many women who wanted to be able to work or you know, have the freedom to marry who they wanted to. And they couldn't. And there was a period where, you know, an Afghan friend of mine moved back to Kabul because she thought, now we can go back, we can set up businesses, it'll all be fine. And over the next few years, it proved that it wasn't and they couldn't. And so much of the talent there, the young Afghans leave because they feel they have no other option. And I genuinely in 2001 too, thought that that would change and that if you gave Afghanistan the time and the space, that politicians there would be able to work it out. But I think it's the conflict is so deep and so entrenched that it will take a lot longer to resolve. Yeah, I've, I, well, you know, I agree with that. I agree with that sentiment. Um, it's it's not. I mean, it's too. It's too. When I talk, when I think about Afghan and and um, you know, the right, was it right? Was it wrong? Did we achieve what we achieve? What did we achieve? And how you know how how valuable was that to the people of Afghanistan? Right. I think there's two. There's two sides to it. Look at it's. There's two factors in it. I look at to try and judge it. And one is, we look, we are looking at, we look at Afghan, we look at other places, we look at Kabul, we look at Helmand, we look at Lashkar, wherever, and we always judge. We look at that and we just dis decide with them a lot of the time, or where they should be as a nation, you know, what freedoms and liberties they should should have. But our input is always based on what what our our understanding of what is right and what is good and what is acceptable to have as a people and what is valuable is based on us and our culture. We're literally a world apart from people in Afghanistan and people in Helmand are a world apart from people in Kabul. You know, in the same way, people in, in those weirdos down in Cornwall are a world apart from people in London, right? <laughs> My Cornish friends will not love you for that. <laughs> oh, God. I could say it. Cornwall was the first Welsh colony. Anyway, that's a different that's a different subject. Um, 
so that's the first thing what what do they see as valuable what do we see and then how, how, how do you choose how would you choose the path and so have the path in the past been the wrong one to take the direct directory you want to put them on and then the second thing i look at is uh again you referencing kabul there the farmers and the people in the sticks and the dashed they the 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 cataclysmic changes if that's the right word that in kabul that could take place politically economically culturally the impact that has on the people in the sticks in the rest of afghanistan is, is minuscule like you said they don't even they don't even they rarely know about it for sometimes mon months later when they do it really makes a difference because their way of living is so simple it's so simple what i would have loved is to have had the benefit of experience in afghanistan before i joined and going okay here's where it's the best here's the places i served in before i joined you know in helmand okay i've got a picture of what it's like then go there operate i, I had the benefit of doing three tours the start of the middle and, and towards the end of the campaign and then towards to get the end and that third tour would be nice to come off i think ah i remember what it was like before and that was improved but i don't have that i can't contextualize where it is now um whereas maybe you can what well, i you were in Kabul 2001, 2002. Are you still in communication with anyone over there? Have you been back since the British campaign they finished? Yeah, I carried on going back to do bureau cover until about, I suppose, 2014 was probably the last one. Yeah, so I haven't been back for six years now, but I do stay in touch with friends there. I did, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do bureau cover in Kabul. So when the, the regular Kabul correspondent went away on holiday or left the country or whatever, and there was a changeover because it was such a good way of actually being there to talk to the politicians but to talk to normal people as well and see what was happening in Kabul politically because as you say Helmand was a world away and you know my impression is that yeah for Kabul life is still really hard really 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 difficult and the last time I think it was the last time that I was based in the bureau there, a restaurant nearby was blown up and quite a few Westerners were killed as well as Afghans because it was a restaurant popular with foreigners. So that's why it was targeted. And I realized when we got to the restaurant to report it the next morning after, to, after dawn had broken, that actually the restaurant was opposite the, old, the first BBC bureau that I'd worked in there and that all of the windows in the BBC Bureau, or what had been the BBC Bureau, were shattered as well. And again, that just kind of brings it home to you, the risks that everyone in Kabul was running. And that was probably, yeah, six or seven years ago. And the whole military effort on the part of the West has you know, gradually wound down. It's still happening in terms of training a bit, but you just think, what, what would the right path be? for Afghanistan? Would it be, you know, purely to, to have aid and help and teaching and training? Was the military effort the right way to go or not? Um, and, and all the things we didn't know back then, had we known, how would we have done things differently? I don't know, because, you know, I really felt when I went to cover Afghanistan and Iraq that what I lacked was a knowledge of the language because it meant that you were always doing things through an interpreter. So you got basically an interpreter's view of the world and not necessarily exactly what people were saying, but what the interpreter either felt was polite for them to say or what they should be saying. And there was a fair bit of yeah, not interpreting accurately going on when it came to, to some of the translators that I'd worked with, not the BBC ones, but certainly when we were using translators hired by the military, I think there was a large part of quite a few of them wanting to make what local people were saying more palatable to the people employing them. And I think that, you know, the difference that I felt when reporting on Germany, for example, I spoke good German. I could chat to people, I could talk to them, I could get the nuance beneath what they were saying. So not just the words that they were saying, but the what they actually meant by them. And although, you know, yeah, I have tried learning many other languages since, there's, there's no way I could ever have got good enough Dari or Pashto or Arabic to really be able to talk to people in that way in Iraq or in Afghanistan. And I think 
that knowledge just makes such a difference if you really can talk to people one to one without translation without an interpreter there you get a whole different level of understanding of how the culture works and i think that yeah with afghanistan in particular you know it is a place that has a long and complex history and the idea that i think naively perhaps people in the west had that you can go and change it within 10 or even 20 years yeah no way that's going to take 50 or 100 and actually the way you as a westerner might think things should be changed may well not be what local people want you, you can do it you can change places in the short space of time but it involves things called invasions and overthrows of the government and completely wiping out it just you know all the like the worst ways of going about changing the ways you don't want to do it so second world war you know um and Falklands, you know, to try and try and completely change a place, but um, that's not who we are. Um, I, I was thinking yesterday about this. I, I think, in a, what will I think of future operations and campaigns that are announced or come about, like Afghan did? And I think if they, I know now that if I know how I feel, it's if they, you know, this is what we plan to go in and do, and go into a place, and I don't know what another Afghanistan type of thing, help out the country. But if it looks to me like they're, they're not planning, well, if they're not planning on staying there for 30, 40, 50 years, which they never would, well, what's the point? Because that's how long it has to take that long. And who's going to commit to it? And I think at the, I think at the top end of the scale, this is understood that you have to stay there for that long, but it's never possible. It's never possible to do that, which makes me now question why were those decisions made to go in Iraq, Afghan, and all the places before? It's not like it's a new thing that's happened, you know. Uh, I'm not only talking about Britain. It's you know, it's, it's a common it's a common theme across the world with 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 place with with first world Western democratic societies. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think for Afghanistan in particular that it came at a time when. You know, NATO as a military alliance was looking at itself and thinking, well, what can we usefully do in the world? And, you know, you had the relationship between the UK and America and the wish and the desire to show that British forces were useful and could be there to do the difficult stuff. And I think all of those things came together. And, yeah, it's, it's fascinating how campaigns are shaped by the governments that are in power then the historical events that have just happened and you know you look at now with coronavirus and everything that's happening no one no country is going to think oh right you know now is the time to go and sort out things that are happening way beyond our borders now every country is going to be looking and saying okay how can we sort this out within our borders and focus on what's happening here at home and i think there was a long period of yeah that liberal interventionism and that that's gone and I think that is a result of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of everything having been shown to be harder than people initially assessed. And possibly because maybe people are not encouraged to speak truth onto power in saying how bloody difficult anything will be. And mm. that is possibly one of the lessons learned for next time, if there is a next time. Do you think, do you think, thinking about the current situation with COVID-19, do you do you think that maybe there is a chance that, well, after this blows over, <laughs> if that's the right expression, across the world, they, I mean, a lot of countries, most countries who have been impacted by it are on their backsides, especially economically, um, under, under a huge amount of pressure. And some are already in, in, in a world of pain before that. And I'm thinking, I'm, the reason I'm asking it, I'm, I'm saying this is I'm thinking back to the, the Falklands. Argentina at the time is going through a huge, if I'm right in saying it, I was, I was one at the time. We're going through a, a huge, they still are, but he, like a, a real, they had a, they had a recession going on, I think. The economy was in, in tatters. They had a lot of internal problems. And and that was, I think, was one of the exact, the, one of the leading factors to the invasion of the, Fal of the Falklands, try and reclaim something, a bunch, bunch of different reasons, right? But do you think there's a, po a possibility now at, with this COVID-19 situation in, that the world is a little bit more volatile, that that the nations who are sort of airing on the teeter on the brink of do we do something crazy, do we not? The North Koreas of the world um, could 
or other places. I mean, look at places like Ukraine and that. Just volatile areas. We could see some conflicts come out of this because nations trying to get back on their feet. I think the world has become, yeah, again, a less predictable place. And that's not just COVID-19, but yeah, it is the knock-on effects, the economic impacts that, you know, if you are Russia or Saudi Arabia and the oil price has gone way, 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 way down and there's a great big glut of oil and you aren't going to make the money that you were going to make. And in somewhere like Saudi, you've got a very young population, you know, might you face trouble as governments, you know, be that Russia or elsewhere or North Korea, for example. Afterwards, if you can't give your people what they need, you know, if people are either starving or jobless, then, yeah, governments, some of them are certainly going to look to see what they can do. But I think equally, what's going to be really interesting is the alliances that come out of this and whether you see forces of nationalism growing and whether you see, yeah, countries kind of, I don't know, just saying, right, we'll go it alone. That a lot of those post-World War II mega international alliances, be that the UN or NATO or whatever they are, that, you know, they are going to have to be really clear about what they're for and re-persuade people of their, their value. Because I think post-COVID-19 and the economic downturn that is likely people are going to be very very careful about you know what their government spend their money on they're going to want money to be spent at home and i think those are the sort of forces that governments are going to have to be incredibly careful with in the future when when you were talking about the volatility of um saudi uh russia reference to the oil price you, you made reference to the fact that Saudi has got a very young population. What's the, what's the relevance of what's the relevance of that? Just I think curious. It's, it's like a lot of places where a young population does mean that you've got a lot of young men, for example, with a lot of energy. If you haven't got jobs for those young men, then you've got a problem because you know all of that energy has to go somewhere. And if people aren't busy being employed and doing useful things then quite often it'll go towards revolution or saying you know things have got to change and i'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing it's just a fact that places that have the youngest or younger populations are more inclined to war but you know because you have a force there that can be recruited to fight and that yeah doesn't necessarily see any other option in order to make money or get status or you know yeah have have some kind of meaning in life so if you look at a lot of African states where wars have been pretty prevalent over time. Again, you know, average age in Africa is, is early 20s compared with, you know, much of Europe where it's in the 40s or the 50s. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and Af I mean, Africa's an entirely different beast altogether, isn't it? Is, uh, to be honest, uh, yeah, I think my, my, Limited experience in Africa, not with the military. Well, I've, I went there training a couple of times with the military and then with the Middle East. I'm becoming more of the opinion that unless unless a nation, going back on the foreign policy, I think unless, in, unless there's something about a nation that threatens your nation, materially threatens it and compromises you know, its safety, then I'm beginning to believe that we should just leave, leave places alone to evolve themselves. To, and, and I use that word liberally, you know. Um, and the reason I say that is because when you try and artificially accelerate the progress of a nation towards where wherever we are now, or wherever the future um, ideal first world situation is, what that looks like, what that model looks like, it. It's like when it's like when a business gets too big for itself, grows too quickly. It just they just fold on themselves and they and they implode. And I think that's what happens with nations you, when they when they all of a sudden become uh, be, become exposed to uh, gifts and assets and resources they didn't have before. Be that money, be that uh, you know buildings, be that pin education, be that I don't know what better traveling and out. 
they they don't know what to do with it because they haven't grown up with that. And I mean, grown up in the term in the in the in the terms of the, the country as it's evolved. And uh, and then you get the power struggles and you get everything else, and you get an imperfect system, I think. And also, I think one of the things that I've seen time and time again is that when you get a conflict where, you know, a lot of people go in to try to help, as they did in Kabul and Afghanistan, then you get a conflict economy where prices go up massively for, you know, rents, housing, whatever, but corruption goes up as well because there's all of these tax dollars looking to be spent somewhere where it's actually really hard to spend it at the rate at which you know congress or whatever is giving you the money and you look at somewhere like Kabul, which was my experience of it and you just think how much good is all of this doing you know clearly there are people here trying to help and doing good things but at the same time an awful lot of this money is not going where people imagined it would and suddenly there's you know a whole lot of money being taken out of the country and spent on, I don't know, luxury flats in Dubai or whatever that, you know, just hasn't reached the poor people as it should. And I don't know how you stop that and on what the best way to do it is, because I think it's something that aid agencies have wrestled with for a long, long time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of money to be made in war, a lot of money, conflict. Yeah, and like you say, and a lot of that money ends up going, especially in recent times, ends up going to uh, to companies, organisations outside of the country. Afghan being a prime example, you know, the Halliburtons of the world. It's crazy, the crazy. The, the money, I mean, the money it generates and doesn't go into the economy in which you're trying to improve, but flip an neck. I'm just conscious of time. Um, what what What's your focus? What are you focus on now as a, as a journalist now? What, what, do you, what do you cover at the minute? I, I don't have a subject anymore. So when I got diagnosed with MS in 2015, I was covering religious affairs. And the idea was to kind of, I suppose, bring the knowledge of foreign affairs and covering conflict and wars to, to covering religion or global religion. But while it was an amazing job, I realized I was getting sicker and sicker. And when I got the diagnosis in 2015, I said to the BBC, you know what, I feel so lousy and so, yeah, chronically ill that I am just going to have to do something that involves a lot more sitting around on my bum doing radio presenting. Oh, you know, but somewhere where you can go into an office, you know, sit in a chair, you don't have to rush around places carrying an awful lot of kit because, you know, remembering the travels that we did for, for defence and actually for covering, you know, the travels of Pope Francis or the Archbishop of Canterbury you're carrying maybe seven or eight or nine pieces of kit and it comes to about yeah, 100 kilos easily, maybe 150 in some cases if you're out on a month's embed and I could no longer carry stuff or you know run to get the helicopter from the plane or whatever or stay up half the night waiting for a helicopter on a helipad in Baghdad or all that stuff that I had you know really loved doing and stories that I really had wanted to cover. I just knew I couldn't do it anymore. So yeah, I changed to radio presenting. I work for Radio 4 PM on mostly on a Saturday, sometimes on a Friday, and well service program called The World This Week and present both of those normally from the office, but at the moment um Saturday PM from home. And it's weird setting up a little studio in my living room. A bit like yours there. <laughs> we were in fact we were, we were talking about this last week, weren't we? That's right. The, the the contrast and the difficulties with not having the person sat in front of you that was really that was really interesting actually mm. not being able to read the body language yeah and it, it is definitely a different experience that you know i think skype and zoom are fantastic inventions but nothing beats actually sitting next to someone you know looking at them knowing where they are in reality as opposed to this you know you could be sitting on the moon for all i know um, it's, it's much harder to, yeah, get what people are feeling or, yeah, it's kind of, it's even things like flickers of discomfort if you're asking someone a question and you can get a lot from body language. I mean, you know, radio and TV, I find them both fascinating in terms of how do you get the best interview out of someone? How do you get someone to respond to a question? Do you sometimes need to even needle them a little bit to get the best out of them? 
because otherwise maybe, and this was actually one thing that drove me mad in covering defence or any kind of politics, was this kind of, you know, the lines to take, that someone has been given a line to take and they are just going to read it out, come what may. And at the end of Iraq, there was a wonderful general who was given the kind of, given the job to, you know, do the interviews as the Brits began to withdraw from Iraq. And he'd clearly been given lots of lines to take. And I mean, lots and lots and lots and lots of lines to take on everything. He'd been media trained to within an inch of his life. And what he ended up saying, and this was a pre-recorded interview, where he said, you know, so how will you feel about you know, the mission as British troops leave Iraq? He said, well, we leave Iraq with our hearts held high and our head in our hands. <laughs> I said, I don't <laughs> think you meant to say that. <laughs> But it was just, it was wonderfully apt and it just kind of said a different kind of truth. But yeah, I hated the, oh, the media training that people get now. It's just, it's all about how not to answer questions. And I actually think that what we see via social media is that authenticity, you know, being yourself, answering as genuinely and honestly as you can. Actually, that's something that people by and large want to, like, respect and the kind of, yeah, media training and lines to take that came in in probably yeah, the 90s and have multiplied ever since are not necessarily doing people any good, you know, that, that if you're a, whether it's a politician or a company director or whatever, yeah, being yourself really counts and being as honest as you can. To me as a, as a viewer and listener, that counts. Whereas if I get the impression that someone's just giving you lines that somebody else has written for them, I don't, yeah, that doesn't really come across that well. I think we've entered a different age. Yeah, I, um, that's interesting. I didn't think we were going to come onto this and we'll, uh, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do a part two to this, but that's really, but before we, before we knock it off, the, that's really interesting there about the authenticity. One of the, I mean, I've been pulling my hair lately about, news media news outlets pulling my hair out really at a dark time i stopped watching i like i've stopped flicking on news in the morning i've even stopped watching breakfast programs to get the news i just i just stopped it of all this covid 19 situation i was really disheartening with stuff because of honesty and different things i'm mean, trying to understand why but i mean that's a, we can have that conversation on, the, on part two I, if you I want recommend radio four and world service radio which are both doing fabulous coverage of everything. Listen to the 1800 news on Radio 4 and you will have half an hour of what you need to know in the world. Eight, so 6 p.m. 6 I'll, p.m. I'll, I'll listen to that. I'll listen to that, definitely. But on the authenticity side, I think uh, this. I think that is one of the primary reasons Trump got into power. One of the primary reasons Trump got into power because he is authentic. And whether you think he's a good person or a bad person, he's authentically... That is him, what you see, because he's so off the cuff. And, I, and it, that authenticity, it brings, in whatever you do as a journalist, as a prime minister, as a president, as a politician, as a, as a CEO of a, you know, a, a FTSE 100 company, that authenticity in being you, it automatically puts you closer to Joe Public, which are the, the people who make the decisions, are the people who spend the money in your chain of, your chain of um, retail outlets, or they're the people who put the votes. And when you come closer to us, Joe Public, it just you, you you're more appealing. You compare Trump to it's the same with Boris Johnson, I think. You compare Trump to Hillary Clinton. Hillary was just politician, same old but 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 towing the party line, saying the things she needs to get said to get ticks in the boxes. And Trump wasn't Trump was just being Trump, you know, being being a, a buffoon, much like Boris Johnson was beforehand. You know, uh, <laughs> it, there's huge value in being authentic, both on a personal level and a professional level. And I think with this COVID nineteen situation, I think people are seeing that in the media. Those those programs or journalists or presenters who are not being that authentic in in the reason they're going down a line or asking a question or who they're talking to or they're it's becoming more obvious now. And uh, which I'm glad of. I'm glad of. I mean, it, create, it annoys people, but I'm also glad it's been been made aware of because you need the authenticity. It, it got, look, we rely on people like you and and other journalists and the media to give us the news and tell us what's going on. And if you can't trust the people who are telling you, then 
It's a pain in the backside. It's a pain in the backside. <laughs> yeah, no, trust, trust is hugely, hugely important, whether that is in politics or journalism or wherever. And it's like that old Hollywood maxim, isn't it, that, you know, if you can fake sincerity, you've got it made. Um, you can't fake trust. You've got to earn it. You've got to deserve it. And I think that one of the real issues for the media now is the polarization of yeah people's thinking. You see that in American politics and you can see that over here and elsewhere now that on things like Twitter, for example, that people have hugely strong feelings and get very, very riled up, but it's almost like they want to choose a tribe to belong to. And, you know, there are massively strong reactions to things that politicians say or to things that, yeah, the journalist questions at COVID briefings at Downing Street. And people are always being judged on, are you part of my tribe or not? And I don't know how we get beyond that because actually that's not necessarily a very healthy place to be at as a society and I think you know post-Covid we are going to have such real economic problems that we are going to have to pull together like you know you have never seen before and a polarised society by and large is not a happy one you know the happiest societies are the ones that are the most equal but I think Covid-19 is exacerbating the inequalities you, to a degree. You hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah, which is one of the reasons I'm most frustrated about it is because at the start of the COVID situation, start of the lockdown, it seemed to me like we were getting. In fact, when I when I spoke to Farage about it, one of the, I brought because he was obviously part of the Brexit. That was the biggest polarization in recent times. Huge divide. And when COVID nineteen kicked off, I thought this might bring us much closer together. Might get rid of that polarization. Like just bring bring people back, bring Britain back to being flipping Britain and not right and left and leave and re, uh, leave and remain. And that's how I felt it was going. And then as COVID nineteen situation's gone on, the polarization coming back. But the the problem is is that because of the way social media inf and uh, and information, social media conveys information and what gets people attention now, it is the negative stuff. Unfortunately, like we're victims of our own habits on social media, which is it's the clickbait. The clickbait isn't happy stuff. The clickbait's like either crazy stuff, which is neutral, or really bad stuff. And you click on it, and because of I think with 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 uh, conventional sort of his, uh, legacy media, legacy news media, where it's based on selling newspapers and people watching TV, well. What has happened over time is less people are buying newspapers and less people watching TV. So news outlets have had to try and come into the, to some, for survival to try and come into the realm of social media and the way information can be in social media to try and capture that that attention back. And, and they've ended up getting caught in the trap of doing the same thing that the clickbait spam stuff was back in the day to get you to submit your credit card deal somewhere or click on an advert. It's the same method that's being used now to get you to get onto us to read the story. Um, but this is, uh, is a completely different. We'll talk. Listen, we'll we'll. That's, we'll, that's we'll, a story for another day. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk about that the next time. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. How to, can people? In fact, say again when your program's on. Six p.m. Oh no, my my program is on five p.m. on on a Saturday on yeah. Radio Four. But I would say that for the best roundup of the day's news, yeah, start at four thirty p.m. for weekday. Then you get bit of the briefing etc and that's on radio 4 p.m but the one i do is on saturdays and usually the briefing has happened by the time we go on air so we just give a little summary of it and do other news but frankly at the moment most of the news is all covid19 well hopefully not for much longer um and you're at caroline wyatt on on twitter, twitter. yeah perfect thank you very much for talking to me today that was really fun no, let's do it again and we can fix journalism in the next one. <laughs> yeah, that might take longer than an hour, though, <laughs> to sort out the new model of journalism. Yeah. Although it has had a renaissance during COVID-19, as people look for information. You look at the telebulletin figures, radio listening, they're all up. So people are looking for trusted sources again and actually thinking, you know what, I just want it, you know, the facts. Don't necessarily need the, the yeah, the uh. click stuff i just want to know what's happened 
we'll definitely dive into that next time. It's been an absolute pleasure, Caroline. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you very much for your time. Take care.